Did y'all get your notepad? Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Congregation of Methodist Church. Welcome to the Catholic. I'm the worship leader over here at the Catholic Contemporary Worship Service. My name is Thomas Potter. It is so good to see everybody. So good to see all your faces in here this morning. And church, we belong. We will get started. We have all we have all come here together, and the clock is showing that it's that it's time for us to begin our time. But on more more than the clock, we have all gathered together, and we have all chosen to to spend our time here in this place today, and to come together to worship the living God, to come together as brothers and sisters and sons and daughters. So, church, I would just uh, not further stand in the way of that. Here, in just a second, we'll begin with a time of praise and a time of worship. But first, I would just uh, like to open this up with a word of prayer, church. Father God, thank you for all of these gathered here. Oh, my. And dear Lord, I just pray you make us, make us present like you are present. Give us, give us hearts, give us hearts that are open, ears that are ready to hear just what, whatever you would speak to us this morning, Father, so that we, we can go out from this space and we can be we can be rejuvenated and we can, we can take what you give us on this time on Sunday morning and just live it out throughout the rest of the week. And Father God, we love you. I pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, I would invite you to stand with us now as we begin with the time of song.
a sign-up list looks just like this for Freedom Sunday. If you plan to be there and if you plan to have a barbecue plate after after um, after our service and after Freedom Sunday and the musical, you know, the music and everything that we're doing, if you plan on being there and if you plan on having a barbecue plate, if you would please sign up so that we may have a record of that and that your food will be ready whenever everything is all said and done. But um Pastor, I'm not forgetting anything. No, that's it. Oh, and church with Freedom Sunday with one big service. Um, it is traditional for us to have communion the first Sunday of the month. But with all of that happening, all all of our services, 8:30, 9 o'clock, 11, we will be observing communion July the 11th, the Sunday after next Sunday. But um. I think that's everything big, all the big news coming up in our church this week. So, children, if you would like to come down for um, a moment with Miss Leslie, I think that is what we will have now. Church, I would invite you to stand with us again as our children are finding their way back to their seats. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Van. You may be seated. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for all we've experienced already in your house of worship today. We thank you for these songs of praise that we've heard. We thank you for the voices that have sung them and the way you have blessed us. And Father, now as we open your word, help us to, to find in it the, the, the words that we need in our lives to bring us power, to bring us joy, to bring us peace. We give this time to you as well. We thank you for each person that's gathered here, uh, families that are here, the children that we've already seen today. Lord, we just thank you that we are all gathered in here uh, in this, uh, this place with one accord. In Christ's name we pray. Jesus uh, told a lot of stories, we call them parables. The reason that he told us uh, parables was to give us a picture, a clear picture of what God is doing in our world. Don't we need that? We need that picture of what God is doing, how God is acting in our world. And the overarching word for that, term for that, is the kingdom of God. It is this church is part of the kingdom of God. Ministries outside of our church, like we will hear from today, like the Gideons, they are part of the kingdom of God as well. And so Jesus told these stories, and it was stories uh, of things that people could relate to because uh, there he was, people that were living off the land. They were agrarian people. So he would say the kingdom of God is like a, a planter who goes out and, and throws seeds out of the ground to plant. They would know that. They'd seen that. The kingdom of God is like someone plowing a field and trying to keep that plow straight and, and knowing where they're going with that. They had seen that as well. He talked about other things like uh, livestock. You know, God is like sheep. It's like goats. It's like tending a herd. It's like going after a lost sheep. Many stories like that. And so one of these stories we're going to share today, if you have your Bibles or you want to look at your Bible apps or just read from the screen. Uh, it is from Mark chapter 4, beginning with verse 26. And it's one of those times when he uses this tree, this bush that grew very commonly in that area called the mustard bush. He also said the kingdom of God is, is if someone would scatter seed on the ground, they would sweep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, With what shall I compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will I use for it? It's like, like a mustard seed which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. And yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nest in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them and they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was growing up, my sister had a little necklace, a little pendant that she would wear to church sometimes, and it had a tiny little glass bulb at the end of it. And inside that glass bulb, if you look real carefully, there was a tiny little seed. That was a mustard seed. And it was to remind us of this parable and other parables about the mustard seed and the mustard plant. In fact, Jesus uh, used that parable four times throughout the Gospels. And one of them, he talked about faith. In Matthew 17, he says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. So we think about that. But when we think about mustard, we don't think about seeds, do we? We think about that bright yellow stuff that we put on our hot dogs or some of us put on our hamburgers. 
You know, it's summertime, it's time for hot dogs and mustard and things like that. And so we think in those terms of something for food, a condiment, something to make it taste better or at least more interesting. And if we want to get fancy, we buy one of those European mustards. It's a little bit different. It can be really good. But when the original hearers of this, the people in Israel, heard Jesus talking about mustard, it must have given them pause. It must have bothered them a little bit. Because they didn't use mustard. They didn't like it. They didn't use it for food. Go to a Middle Eastern restaurant today, or Lebanese or others, and find a, a, a jar of mustard or a bottle of mustard on the table. It's just not part of their cuisine. No. Mustard to them was that thing that those hated Roman soldiers ate with their food. Rome invented mustard. Ground up the seeds, mixed it with wine or vinegar, and used it as a condiment. But the people of the Middle East didn't. Rabbin a rabbinical horse uh, sources tell us that anyway. In fact, mustard was not a plant that was well liked. It would be like me saying, the kingdom of God is like a bunch of dandelions. You know how much you love dandelions, right? Or the kingdom of God is like Johnson grass that grows in your yard. Boy, isn't that great. That's how mustard was to them. Why? Well, it was an invasive plant. It was something that if you got it in your yard or your garden or in your field, you wanted to get it out because it took over. Those tiny little seeds that were in that bulb that my sister wore also are blown everywhere. And so if you have one mustard plant, pretty soon you're going to have a hundred mustard plants. And they grow big. They grow big. They're the largest of the bushes of that area. So they're very invasive. Why would Jesus choose mustard to talk about the kingdom of God? He's talking about something very small and seemingly insignificant. He's talking about, I believe, the people that were following him at the time that to the world seemed small and insignificant. Think about the disciples that Jesus was first calling. He bypasses all the seminaries and yeshivas and all of those places of higher learning that they were there in Jerusalem. All those polished city people with proper language and good clothing and good breeding. And where does he go? He goes to areas like Capernaum and Galilee, the backwater. He goes to the agrarian people that are there. They're making their living from the, the, the earth. People that were not afraid to get their hands dirty and get dirt on their sandals in order to feed their families. That's who Jesus goes to first. He goes to the shores of the Lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, and there's a bunch of fishermen. Well, you know how fishermen smell? <laughs> they smell like fish. Why? Because that's what they do. They weren't the polished people that you would think it would need to be those that would change the world. They were the small, insignificant seeds to the world. And yet that's who Jesus chose. He chose people like Peter, who had a problem with being impulsive, also had a problem with fear in his life, and he denied that he ever knew Christ. And he chose Peter. Later he chooses Paul, who by his own condition had a some sort of thorn in the flesh, had some sort of physical issue. And he was also called a stutterer and a stammerer by people that heard him speak. He chose people like the other disciples, like Matthew, a tax collector that would have been hated by the people. A political radical named Simon, Simon the Zealot. These were people that you would not think God would include as the leaders of his kingdom, and yet it is from those seeds, those mustard seeds, that the church continued to grow and grow, and as it broke the barriers outside of Jerusalem and into Samaria and into Judea and into the uttermost parts of the world, like that mustard plant, it could not be stopped. 
But here's the other thing. They also provided protection for all of those birds in the air. In 1910, a young uh, baby was born in Albania. I don't know about you, but I'd be challenged to find Albania on a map. I think it's part of Macedonia today. 1910, she was born to a fairly poor family, a grocer, trying to make a living and feed his family. Her name was Agnes Boliatri. I think that's how you pronounce it. My Albanian is not so good these days. Agnes Boliatri. She was, grew up to be all of about five feet tall. She felt called by God to be a teacher. So she did that. She showed some promise. She was a teacher there locally. But then God called her again to leave that area and go all the way to India and to work in India with the lowest caste of people there, the people they call the untouchables. She later changed her name to Mother Teresa, or became called Mother Teresa, as she won the Nobel Peace Prize. She founded the Sisters of Charity. No one could have seen that coming. No one would say, oh yeah, that, that's a likely candidate for someone to make any incredible impact on the world and change the way we think about people and, and the dead and the care for, uh, for the dying and for the infirmed in the lowly situations. And yet Mother Teresa did that. We know that she was short in stature. She was not someone who was beautiful to look at. In her own journal, she struggled with her own faith that she led others to faith. And yet God used that mustard seed planted there and those, the produce of that mustard plant continue around the world today on that work. You see, God can use me, he can use you. It doesn't matter your physical limitations, it doesn't matter how educated you are, uneducated, your way of living, your, your, your way of, of, or your background, God can use all us mustard seeds to spread his gospel. And when we do, we grow into a plant. And that's what this church is, I believe. We're that home, we're that shelter for people who have nowhere else to go, who would not be accepted in any other club. Jesus said, that mustard plant, that great shrub gives home to all these birds in the air who have nowhere else to go. And they come and they, they nest and they raise their children, their, their eggs there, they, they hatch and, and fledge and, and they multiply there in the shade, in the protection of that plant. We are that here in this community. And a mustard plant or a mustard bush doesn't select which birds get to come and which birds have to go away. It is inclusive of all of the birds there, not just the pretty blue birds that we like to look at and hear sing, not just the beautiful cardinals with their bright colors, but those noisy blue jays too those annoying mockingbirds, too, those crows, those blackbirds, all of them are welcome to be a part of that bush. Folks, we need to remember that is who we are. We are those seeds, but we are also that plant. That is the image that God has given us. We can remake this place to look like ourselves, look like our values, look like our politics, look like our lifestyle, but God has much bigger things for us to do. Writer Brian McLaurin gives a great example of this. Now during the COVID thing, uh, a lot of people got back into putting puzzles together. Everybody puzzles, the thousand piece jigsaw puzzles, some people in my family are doing that. 
They kind of rediscovered what an intricate thing that could be. So here's the thing, you get one of those thousand piece puzzles, right? And you open the box up, dump it out on the table, start separating all the pieces, and, and then what do you do next? Well, you try to find those corner pieces first, right? And then you start trying to find the edge pieces, and you separate all of those pieces into different colors, different groupings that might go together. But, but the thing is, you've got that box there with that picture. So you know what you're trying to put together. You got the image clear there. That's where we're headed. We're making this out of that. That's the challenge. But Brian McLaurin says, what if somebody throws the box away? Thinks you don't need it anymore. What if you're not sure with all those thousands of pieces what goes where? What it's supposed to look like? What the end result is supposed to be? Would you just use your imagination? Would you maybe try to just jam those pieces together to make something that looked like you or me or something we like? What would that look like? How messed up would that be? It certainly wouldn't be what was intended by that artist. God has given us the image of the church right here. We sometimes make it our own image, our own thing, our own little club, our own exclusive group. We want to make it to look like us. And when we jam all those pieces together and we look back and we think, what happened here? Why is it such a mess? How come this is not working? How come these pieces are not fitting together? We just go back to the image. Are we that mustard bush that invites all, welcomes all, gives shelter and protection and nurture to all? Are we like those seeds that go out and are spread through our community and bring the word of God? I'm glad to say that there are organizations in our community like Gideon's who are doing just that. They're spreading that seed when they give out those little New Testaments to the military or to schools that will allow that now. They're spreading that word through Bibles and hotel rooms. Their work is difficult, but it is good. And Jerry White is going to be talking to us about that today. Jerry, are you here? There he is. Okay, come on. <laughs> Good to see you there, brother. <laughs> Glad you made it over. He was at the 830 service. Jerry, come and share with us now. Jerry, father of Micah, grandfather of Ian, and he is here with his wife, Charlotte. So glad to have you. Thank you. So if I speak like this, can y'all hear me? Y'all good? Let's get a microphone, folks. Here we go. Okay, thank you very much. You want one too? <laughs> All right. Thank you for having us and, and allowing us to speak to your church. There was an emergency in Birmingham, Alabama. A man was dying in a hospital. He had to have a surgery that only one person in, the, in Alabama and in, in Birmingham there could perform to save his life. That doctor was in the wrong hospital. He was six miles away. He went and jumped in his car, was getting out, trying to get in traffic. Traffic was so bad, he could not get out of the parking lot. He parked his car walked six miles to the other hospital and saved that man's life with the surgery that he could perform. The, the story went viral. They called him a hero. He met with many reporters weeks after that, and he told them, I am no hero. I am just a physician, a surgeon, 
who would not let a man die on my shift. Get him to like that. We want to save the lives of people that are dying in Christ, that do not know Christ, because they have not been told, they have not heard, they have not read his word, and they are dying in Christ. In Louisiana, on the average, about 138 people die every day. Today, on average, 138 people will die in Louisiana. How many of those people are dying without Christ? It concerns us as Gideons, and we want to reach them for Christ. So we have a mission as Gideons, a, a group of professional men, and our wives are called the auxiliary to help us. We distribute Bibles all over the world to over 200 countries and 108 languages. And we try to spread this word to people in every way that we can where people need. We give them to policemen, firemen, EMTs. We get pass them out in schools, in fifth grade, and in universities. And we get the young people to help us pass out Bibles in high schools. And we take them to hospitals, nursing homes, uh, doctor's facilities, in prisons. We pass out these Bibles that you probably have seen in hotel rooms. And these Bibles, the full Bible uh, is also uh, put in hospital rooms. You might have seen them there. But people need to hear God's word. So we, we are, have a mission to give God's word to people in all of these different walks of life. And people are touched. And there are thousands and thousands of testimonies about people who have been touched by having God's word in their hand. I wanted to just give you two today. First one is Daniel. Uh, Daniel was a, a old elderly man in the hospice ward of the hospital uh, on his last days. He was uh, crippled to the point of being in the fetal position uh, and, and could not hardly move. Well, I gave him a Bible. I gave him one of these brown Bibles, like this right here. This brown Bible is the one that we pass out in correctional institutions. This man was in the hospice ward at Angola Prison. And he had no hope. He was dying. He was crippled. And uh, he was in prison. He didn't have hope. But I told him about Christ that could change all that. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And I told him that Jesus was the way to heaven. He is how we get there. He is the truth. There is no lie about Jesus. It's all truth. And he is the one in whom we find life. And I shared with him how he died for his sins. And if you confess your sins to Christ, you can have that new life with him in heaven. And there's a promise there from Christ. And we know Christ does not lie because he said he's the truth. In John 14, just a few verses ahead, Jesus said, verse 3, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will return to receive you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. So where is Christ? He's in heaven. So we're going to get to go to heaven with him. And if you go back and look at in verse 1 of, of John 14, you'll see what he's preparing for us. And they are mansions. So uh, Daniel prayed to have God forgive his sins. He gave his life to Christ. And I wish you could have seen the smile on his face when he looked up from that prayer and knew that he was going to have freedom that he had not known in century, uh, not century, decades, and he was going to have a new body, a new resurrected body that was perfect. The Word of God changed Daniel's life. The other one is Rebecca. I met Rebecca just uh, south of LSUA at the evacuation center. The Rebecca was from Ryder, Texas. This was during Hurricane Harvey, and there was a lot of people there at the evacuation center. They bust them in, bus after bus after bus, 
and we went and passed out New Testaments that we do at um, public gatherings like that, the orange ones. And Rebecca was sitting on the uh, concrete curb in front of the building, and she looked kind of dejected, and I went and sat beside her, and I gave her one of these Bibles, and I, I found out some more things about her. Uh, her house was underwater. She was obviously expecting. She was not married. So here is a young, expecting mother whose house is underwater in a different state with four or five hundred people she didn't know. Where is your hope? What do you look for? To fight for life. And I told her about Christ. I told her that I was not going to be able to solve all of her problems, but I knew a man that could help her through them. And that man was Jesus Christ. And I shared with her about how if she gave her life to Christ, asked him to forgive her sins, that she could find comfort in her situation. And she could find peace a peace that surpasses all understanding. Here again, John chapter 14. I must think I, I like this, this chapter. John chapter 14, verse 27 says, My peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives I to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. So Rebecca had the peace that she could make it through her ordeal with the help of Christ. And that's the only one that could help her in her situation. So those just two testimonies, how uh, me as a Gideon and having testaments to pass out were able to touch the lives of people. And we must help as many of these people as we can. And we need your help. We need to bring the world to Christ. Now we partner with churches. And the Gideons meet every Saturday morning at 7 o'clock, and we pray for churches. We pray for pastors, and we pray for the needs of many, many, many people that are, their names have come to us. So every Saturday morning at 7 o'clock, if you get up, you can be assured there's Gideons meeting all over the world. Of course, 7 o'clock follows the time zone. <laughs> but it's, it's the Gideons all over the world meet at 7 o'clock every Saturday morning in unity of prayer, praying for churches. But we need your help. So how can you help? You can pray for us, pray for endurance, that we can, can do all the things that we need to do to give Christ a message to the world. You can give. And so how can you give? Well, we're gonna have a group of men after your service in the back here that can collect cash donations. If you wanna write a check and leave a check, you can do that. Um, the checks are made to Gideon's International. And if you don't, if you're not able to do that, uh, you can mail a check in the envelope and these brochures. Jimmy, can y'all get these out now and pass them out? They don't have them yet. Have you got some help? Okay, good, thanks. So uh, we have these brochures that, that you can, you're going to get. and. There is a place, an envelope in here that you can mail and check. There's also, if there, if all else fails, there's another way. Here's a little uh, scan code uh, right here on the corner. You can go to Gideon's International and donate online if, if all else fails. So you can help us by giving and, and spread God's word to the world. You can join us. You know, we need Gideon's all the time. Uh, the, the membership of Gideon's has dropped because of age. We need some fresh, new, young blood. And we have a very strong camp here in Pineville, but our surrounding camps, they need some help because they don't have as many young people as, as we do. So uh, you can join us and help us, and why you can join too. And uh, you can get your young people involved. You know, we have a, a book called The Life Book, Two books. One is the book of uh, John and the other is the book of Mark. And these are written for teenagers in a style that teenagers would appreciate. And these are free to churches for their youth to pass out in their schools. So it has to be ordered by the minister or the youth minister. And they, they are free of charge. And they come in cases of 100. So if you'd like to get 100 of these in, give them to your youth and they want to be our missionaries 
they can pass these out. We, we passed out millions of these around the world as well. So they can get involved. And the other way you can help is through the Gideon Card Program. You have a card rack in front of the foyer um, and the, the main sanctuary. That card rack has uh, in memory cards, thinking of you cards and recognition cards. So if you have a loved one that has passed away and you usually buy flowers for them, what happens a week from then? What happens to those flowers? They go into trash, don't they? They're dead, they're wilted, and they start falling apart. So if you would, in lieu of buying flowers, you can, can get an in-memory card, and you can donate Bibles in honor of that loved one. And in these cards, there's actually two envelopes. There's a small envelope where you can give a contribution to the Gideons, and there's a card, an in-memory card, that you can write a note on and say, I have donated so many Bibles to go around the world in honor of our loved one. And that's a great way to help people. So please use the card program. About one third of our funds comes from the card program. And just letting you know, 100% of the money from the cards, 100% of the money that you do donate goes to buying and distributing Bibles around the world. All of our administrative costs are handled by the Jews of the Gideon and other endowments that we were given. 100% of the money you give buys Bibles. We need your help. We need to give the word to the world. We need to give people new life, help save their life, like that doctor did. We are Christians. People are dying without Christ. Let's don't let them die without Christ on our shift. Thank you for helping. Jerry, thank you for sharing, and we thank all the other Gideons who came with him today to support and pray for him. And uh, you've heard the word of God. Uh, it is now time, if you'd like to respond, uh, to come and pray. Our band is going to lead us in one final song. Uh, as we're doing that, if God has touched your heart today, and you'd like to come, you realize the word of God needs to go forth through you and through me. We need to be that seed that is planted as the Gideons are doing. Let's stand now as we hear this. If you have a decision to make, I'll be standing here, over here. If you'd like to just come forward and pray, you're welcome to do that. Build your kingdom here, let the darkness be. Show your mighty hands in our streets and lands. Set your church on fire when this nation met. Change the